Hi, my name is Mary Nolan, and I'm here with another episode of Connecting Through Stories with New Hampshire Humanities. This is part of our Connections Adult Literacy and Skills Program. If you'd like lesson plans and extension activities to go along with this book, please click the link in the description below. As a recreational kayaker and resident of New Hampshire's Lakes region, water and rivers are a way of life here. And that's why I chose for you the true story, A River Ran Wild by Lynn Cherry. In this story, Lynn Cherry tells the history of the Nashua River, from its discovery and inhabitants by Native Americans, to changes inflicted by European colonists and the Industrial Revolution, to its eventual cleanup led by Marion Stoddard and others. Now, it wouldn't be an episode of Connecting Through Stories if I didn't give you some essential questions to consider. These questions can be answered either before or after reading the story and are meant to help you think more deeply about the issues raised, as well as help connect the material to you. Here they are. What rivers are near you? How do rivers and water impact our daily lives? What factors or historical events contributed to the pollution and then cleanup of the Nashua River? How have perspectives towards natural resources and the natural environment changed throughout history? And finally, how would you define progress? At what lengths should a society go to achieve progress? A River Ran Wild by Lynn Cherry. Long ago, a river ran wild through a land of towering forests. Bears, moose, and herds of deer, hawks and owls, all made their homes in the peaceful river valley. Geese paused on their long migration and rested on its banks. Beavers, turtles, and schools of fish swam in its clear waters. One day, a group of native people, searching for a place to settle, came upon the river valley. From atop the highest mountain, known today as Mount Wachusett, they saw a river nestled in its valley, a silver sliver in the sun. They came down from the mountain, and at the river's edge, they knelt to quench their thirst with its clear water. Pebbles shone up from the bottom. Let us settle by this river, said the chief of the native people. He named the river Nashaway, river with the pebbled bottom. By the Nashaway, Chief Weawa's people built a village. They gathered cattails from the riverbanks to thatch their dwellings. In the forest, they set fire to clear brush from the forest floor. In these clearings, they planted corn and squash for eating. They made arrows for hunting and canoes for river travel. When the Indians hunted in the forest or caught salmon in the river, they killed only what they needed for themselves, for food and clothing. They asked all the forest creatures that they killed to please forgive them. The Nashua people saw a rhythm in their lives and in the seasons. The river, land, and forest provided all they needed. The Nashua lived for generations by the clear, clean, flowing river when one day, a pale-skinned trader came with a boatload full of treasures. He brought shiny metal knives, colored beads, and cooking kettles, mirrors, tools, and bolts of bright cloth. His wear seemed like magic. The Nashua welcomed him, traded furs, and soon a trading post was built. In the many years that followed, the settler's village and others like it grew and the Nashua became the Nashua. The settlers worked together to clear land by cutting down the forest, which they thought were full of danger, wilderness that they would conquer. They hunted wolves and beaver, killing much more than they needed. Extra pelts were sent to England in return for goods and money. The settlers built sawmills along the river, which the Nashua's current powered. They built dams to make the mill ponds that were used to store the water. They cut down the towering forest and floated tree trunks down the river. The logs were cut up into lumber, which was used for building houses. 
The settlers built fences for their pastures, plowed the fields, and planted crops. They called the land their own and told the Indians not to trespass. Hunting land disappeared as the settlers cleared the forest. Indian fishing rights vanished as the settlers claimed the river. The Indians were disrupted and they began to fight the settlers. The wars raged for many years, but the Indians' bow and arrow were no match for against, against gunpowder. And so the settlers' rifles drove the Indians from the land. Through a hundred years of fighting, the Nashua was a healthy river, sometimes dammed for grist and sawmills, but still flowing, wild and free. Muskrats, fish, and turtles still swam from bank to bank. Deer still came to drink from the river, and owls, raccoons, and beaver fed there. At the start of a new century, an industrial revolution came to the Nashua's banks and waters. Many new machines were invented. Some spun thread from wool and cotton. Others wove the thread into cloth. Some machines turned wood to pulp, and others made pulp into paper. Leftover pulp, and dye and fiber was dumped into the Nashua River, whose swift flowing current washed away the waste. These were times of much excitement, times of progress and invention. Factories along the Nashua River made new things of new material. Telephones and radios and other things were made of plastics. Chemicals and plastic waste were also dumped into the river. Soon the Nashua's fish and wildlife grew sick from this pollution. The paper mills continued to pollute the Nashua's waters. Every day, for a decade, pulp was dumped into the Nashua, and as the pulp clogged up the river, it began to run more slowly. As the pulp decomposed, bad smells welled up from the river. People who lived near the river smelled its stench and stayed far from it. Each day as the mills dyed paper red, green, blue, and yellow, the Nashua ran whatever color the paper was dyed. Soon no fish lived in the river. No birds stopped on their migration. No one could see pebbles shining up through the murky water. The Nashua was dark and dirty. The Nashua was slowly dying. One night, Oiana, a descendant of Wiawa, who still lived by the Nashua, had a dream so vivid that he awoke in wide-eyed wonder. In his dream, Chief Wiawa's spirit returned to the river and saw it as it was now, still and deadly. Chief Wiawa mourned for the Nashua, but where his tears fell upon the dirty waters, the waters were cleansed until the river once again flowed freely. The next morning, Oiana went to speak to his friend Marion. When he told her of his dream, she said, I had this dream also. River with the pebbled bottom is the name Wiawa gave it, but today no pebbles shine up through the Nashua's river waters. Together they decided something must be done. Marion traveled to each town along the Nashua. She spoke of the river's history and of her vision to restore it. No longer do we have a river. It's a stinking, smelly sewer. But it wasn't always this way. People listened and imagined a sparkling river full of fish. They imagined pebbles shining up through clear waters. They signed petitions and sent letters. They protested to politicians and showed them jars of dirty water. They convinced the paper mills to build a plant to process the waste. They persuaded the factories to stop dumping. Finally, new laws were passed and factories stopped polluting. Slowly, slowly, the Nashua's current began to clean its water. Year by year, the river carried away the dyes and fiber to the ocean. Marion and Oiana thanked the people who had helped to clean the Nashua. Through the meadows, towns, and cities, the Nashua once again flows freely. Paper pulp no longer clogs it. Chemicals no longer foul it. Now we can walk along its banks and row up its fragrant waters. We can set our boats upon it, 
and with its current, drift downstream. Once again, the river runs, runs wild through a towering forest greenway. Red-tailed hawks and barred owls live here. Geese pause from their long migration and rest on the river banks. Deer come to drink from the river's waters. We too have settled by this river. Pebbles shine up through the clear water. Nashua is what we call it, river with the pebbled bottom. I hope you enjoyed learning about the rich history of the Nashua River. It truly is a natural and historical resource of New Hampshire, and I would encourage you to go visit it if you're able. Please feel free to join the conversation below by answering any of the essential questions that I posed or for sending suggestions on future readings or topics. Finally, if you're able, please consider supporting our Connections program at New Hampshire Humanities so we can continue doing this work across the state of New Hampshire. Until next time.